I'm so glad that you have joined us. Like I said, we are in a winter wonderland that we slept together. Um, going into the mezzanine, um, I was able to find this beautiful tree. And um, those of you who those of you who actually are at church for extended periods of time, uh, staff members, you know how cold it gets here. So I decided to do something to warm ourselves up. So, uh, boom, there we go, fireplace. So just join me for this very corny and cheesy setup for our message and sermon. If you're taking notes, I really want you to um, write the title of this sermon. And I want you to think about it as well. It's called The Reason for the Season. Now, when Vic was asking me earlier, you know, what's the title of the sermon? I said, the reason for the season, and there was a chuckle, there was a chortle, and the reason why is because it's a very generic thing to say in the church, the reason for the season. We know what the reason for the season is, but today, this morning, I want us to get involved to what that title actually means and what it means for us as believers in Jesus. So I want to begin by asking you a question. Do you know what the best kind of questions are? I want you to think about that. Do you know what the best kind of questions are? I have Vic with me. I have Pastor Daniel with me. Think about that, guys. What are the best kind of questions? For me, the best kind of question is the one that I know the answer to. <laughs> that's the best kind of question for me. If I know the answer to that question, that's the type of question I want to be asked. It was a few days ago that Salome and I were kind of just hanging out, sitting on the couch after dinner. And uh, with the recent passing of Alex Trebek, uh, the Jeopardy host, we were just watching some Jeopardy on Netflix. And uh, low-key, that was one of my favorite shows growing up. Uh, I absolutely loved that show. There was a gentleman by the name of Ken Jennings, if you guys remember that. He was, I think, on record of, breaking, of being on the show for the longest time and, and having the most... Uh, winnings of anyone on a game show. And so every day when I was in, um, I believe in eighth grade, I would, you know, turn on Jeopardy and watch Ken Jennings uh, fight the good fight and just cheer him on. And it was so fun to watch that show. And eventually I myself came to love trivia and all these things. And so uh, when it comes to trivia, hey, if there's ever a trivia night, you want me to be on your team. I'll just leave it at that. So when the show was going on, and um, the categories were, you know, on, and I was answering the questions. And Salome, I'll be honest, Salome was a little impressed. She's like, how do you know all this stuff? And I'm like, I just do. I don't know why. I just threw, maybe, you know, I'm like that dude, what's the Slumdog Millionaire. I've never seen the movie, but I, I hear that it's kind of like about an Indian guy that's really good at trivia. Maybe I should watch it sometime. But Salome's asking me, how do you know all this stuff? And I'm like, I just do. But where I was stumped is when Salome asked me, can you explain to me what those answers mean? Well, I could say what the answer is, but if you want me to explain the answer, then I was at a loss of words. So many times, it's very easy knowing the answer to a question. But in order to explain the answer to that question, that's where sometimes we can find ourselves stumped. So for example, if I'm going to give you the question, this thing allows you to access the whole of human knowledge from your computer or from your phone. You would say, the internet. Now, if I were to ask you, can you explain the internet? That's a different thing. If you were to ask me to explain, explain the internet, all I can say is there's magic in the screen and it just magically pops up. I don't know how the internet works. If you were to ask, uh, this thing hangs in the sky and gives off light, I would say the sun. But if you were to ask me, how does the sun work? I actually wouldn't know. If you were to ask me, this thing has four wheels and can take you from places wherever you want to go as long as there's gas, I would say a car. But if you were to ask me, how does a car work? I wouldn't know. So knowing is one thing, but explaining sometimes is a whole nother department altogether. So if I were to again ask you a question, this holiday is celebrated on the 25th of December. We would say Christmas, but if I were to say explain it, sometimes, especially in today's culture, when Christmas has become so commercialized and so taken out of its true meaning, 
we can be at lost of what the true meaning, the real reason for this season is. So we are officially into what I call the proper Christmas season because Christmas starts promptly after Thanksgiving and it ends promptly on December 26. Now, I shared this, I believe, a few weeks ago with our um, folks that joined the Bible session and with our students. Uh, I find it very annoying when Christmas season starts before Thanksgiving. Anyone else agree with me? Raise your hand. Pastor, do you agree with me? And, and do they celebrate Christmas? Um, what, you guys have Boxing Day or something in yeah, Canada, Boxing right? Boxing Day after Christmas. Yeah, after Christmas. So in America, you know, Christmas is a, it's after Thanksgiving, ends on the 26th. And because it's become so commercialized, you see Christmas decorations before Thanksgiving. And that's annoying. And it's, to me, it should be a crime to put up anything Christmas before Halloween. If you're celebrating Christmas for Halloween, please come see me so you can get a smack. <laughs> um, but please, Christmas, we are in the Christmas season. It's a time to celebrate the, the many themes of joy, kindness, sharing, uh, extending gifts, and uh, just joy to one another. These are all themes that are wonderful. But there is something uh, that should get more recognition, and that is, again, the reason for the season. Again, if I were to ask you that question, what is the reason for the season? The answer would obviously be Jesus, but there is more to that answer. And we're going to be looking at that. So Christmas can be easily defined and understood by following three categories. And if you're taking notes, please write this down. So Christmas can be understood by looking at these three categories, that is the plan, the promise, and the person. This morning, we're gonna be talking about the plan, the promise, and the person. So for us to understand the significance of Christmas, we're gonna be looking at Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. If you have your Bible, I wanna encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. While you're turning to that passage, I also want to encourage you that today is the first Sunday of the month. Today is Communion Sunday. In front of me, I have the elements. I want to encourage you to go to your kitchen, uh, go to your pantry, and get the elements out, and we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper together at the end of our message. So Matthew 16, 13 through 20, it says this, Jesus came into the country of Caesarea Philippi. Now, he asked his followers, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say that you're John the Baptist, and some say you're Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the early preachers. And Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said, You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, you are happy because you did not learn this from any man, but my Father in heaven has shown you this. And I tell you that you are Peter. On this rock I will build my church. The powers of hell will not be able to have power over my church, and I will give you the keys of the holy nation of heaven. For whatever you do not allow on earth will not be allowed in heaven, and whatever you allow on earth will be allowed in heaven. Then with strong words, he told his followers to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, normally you wouldn't associate this particular passage with Christmas, but the crux of what we're going to be looking at, the crux of um, what we can see in the meaning of Christmas is found in Peter's answer. Now, like I mentioned earlier, the best questions are the ones that you know the answer to. The disciples would ask the question, you know, who do people say that I am? They were partially correct. They were saying, Jesus, you are someone special. Jesus, you are someone amazing. There is something extraordinary about you. But it wasn't until Peter answered that we really got to explain the answer. And Peter's explanation, Peter's answer, basically came down to four words. Four simple words, which are, you are the Christ. If we're going to be looking at this passage the word Christ and Messiah are interchangeable. Messiah is Hebrew. Christ is the Greek translation of Messiah. So Messiah is Hebrew and Christ is the Greek translation 
of Messiah. See, this acknowledgement made by Peter is the acknowledgement that we celebrate during the Christmas season. We are recognizing that Jesus is not just a man, but something else altogether. Jesus is something else entirely. Again, this morning, we're going to have an in-depth look at the meaning of Christmas, and we're going to explain the significance of Peter's answer by looking at the plan, the promise, and the person. Amen. Let's just begin with a word of prayer. Father God, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you that we have the ability to come together. We have the ability to worship together. We have the ability to still continue to honor the Sabbath this morning. Father God, I pray that as we get into the reason for this season, the meaning of Christmas, the meaning of you sending your son, Jesus, to die for us. I pray, Lord, that we can open our mind, we can open our hearts, we can open our spirit to receive what you have to say. And Lord, as we prepare for the Lord's table, I pray that we can examine ourselves, Lord, and we can prepare our hearts for partaking of the Lord's Supper. We ask all these things in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's get into the plan. Let's get into the plan. Whenever God's people got in trouble, God always had a card up his sleeve, and that card looked like one man or one woman to stand in the gap and to rescue his people. When it came uh, to slavery, God sent Moses to rescue his people from slavery in Egypt. When it came to uh, fighting the Canaanites, there was Joshua. We heard about, we remember Joshua, Joshua, who stretched forth the spear and brought down Jericho and marched around and and conquered the uh, promised land and the Canaanites for the children of Israel. When it came to defeating the giant that no one else could stand up against, God sent David. When it came to rescuing his people from an unjust law, rescuing them from almost extermination, God sent Esther. So there are very Uh, various men and women that God had used to rescue his people when they were in trouble. But there was one thing that was too big, one problem that was too big for one person to handle, and that was the sin of mankind. The sin of mankind. The weight of sickness, pain, and death was far too great for an undertaking for one person to do. It was sin that brought sickness, pain, and death. See, the ultimate consequence of sin was that it separated us from the presence of God. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Sin brought a problem, and the problem unknowingly triggered a plan from God. See, when sin entered the garden and doomed mankind, God started to plan. And here's the thing about planning. When you plan, you only plan when you want an intended outcome. If there's something that you're wanting to happen, if there's something that you're wanting to take place, what do you do? You sit down and you start to plan. So when sin entered the world through Adam and Eve, God said, I'm going to plan an outcome. I'm going to sit down and plan something. See, what is amazing is that in planning, God did something that is unpredictable. See, he had just made man from the dust of the ground, and breathed life into man. The Bible says God took man, made him out of clay, and breathed the Spirit of God in him, and Adam took his first breath. And when Adam messed up, guess what? God could have just crumpled it like a piece of paper, thrown it away, taken up another piece of dirt, clay, and breathed life into it again. But God did something unpredictable. He did something um, illogical. He decided that for the plan of redemption that he was going to continue with what he had created. See, this plan of redemption was so great, it was it was greater than starting over. You see, it's very easy to start over, but to take something that's mired and broken and turn it into something beautiful, God said, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna make it greater, but I'm gonna initiate a plan. So throughout time and through the various passages, In the Old Testament, God gave a hint and God gave a glimpse of what he had in store to redeem the broken relationship. See, what God had in store for the ultimate win was too good to be true that he had to reveal it through various passages and stories through the Holy Spirit. If we look at the Old Testament, we see many parallels of Jesus and 
stories and people in the Old Testament. We see Abraham sacrificing his only begotten son, Isaac. We see Jacob having 12 sons, like Jesus had 12 disciples. We see Joseph being falsely accused and being betrayed and sold for silver. We see Moses being called out of the wilderness to lead his people from bondage to the promised land. And we see God's promise given to David that he would establish his lineage forever by bringing forth the Messiah through David. We even see Jonah in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, like Jesus was in the tomb for three days and three nights. So many of these stories were examples and hints at the plan that God has given through his promise and through his word. See, the plan was to take something broken and to make it beautiful once more. See, anytime God plans, he has an outcome in mind. Many of us have been, um, you know, there's a song called, that our young people know by artists called Drake, called God's Plan. That was very popular a few years ago. See, in fact, I believe it was Richard uh, Tam. Uh, that was his graduation song. <laughs> so Richard, if you're watching, that's a shout out to your graduation song. Uh, when God plans, there are human plans, then there is God's plan. God said, you know what? Though Adam and Eve messed up in the garden, though they screwed up royally, I'm going to take what they broke and I'm going to make something beautiful and I'm going to make something restored out of it. His plan was in the very beginning, God said, uh, he gave a hint to it when he said uh, to Eve, the seed, the descendant of you is going to take his heel and crush the head of the serpent. So after the plan, to solidify that plan, God gave a promise. You see, the plan just didn't sit on the shelf. It was almost immediately promised and put into action right in the Garden of Eden, just like I mentioned earlier. God said to Eve, it's going to be your descendant that is going to put his seal and crush the head of that serpent that deceived you and caused you to bring sin into this world. There are 574 specific verses in the Old Testament that refer to a personal Christ, a personal Messiah that will serve as God's fulfillment plan in restoring his relationship with mankind. I'm just going to read you a few verses that we're going to look at. Isaiah 7, chapter 7, verse 14, it says that this promise will be born of a virgin. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it says this promise would be born in Bethlehem of the tribe of Judah. In uh, Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 16, it says, This promise would have a throne and a kingdom and a dynasty starting with the King David that will last forever. The promise that God was preparing was to be called the Messiah, the Christ. This was to be God's plan and promise made flesh. You see, the word Messiah is very interesting. It means the anointed one. It means when you take something and you consecrate it and you set it apart. See, in the Bible, anointing means you take oil and you anoint it and you set it apart for a special purpose or a special plan. It's like almost like a tool. We use the right tool for the right job. You don't use a tool for anything. You use it for a specific task. So when God was starting the plan and he was starting the promise, he had something specific and that was the anointed one of the Messiah. So the promise was not to establish just an earthly kingdom, but to establish that was limited by borders, language, culture, or race. But it was to establish a heavenly kingdom where all, cit where all of mankind were encouraged to be citizens by putting their trust in this anointed one called the Messiah. The Bible continues to give promises and prophecy by saying, in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, he would be pierced for our transgression and crushed for our iniquities. In Psalm 16, 10, it says, he would be resurrected from the grave for God would not allow his Holy One to suffer decay. One of the things that set this person apart was that for this plan and for this promise to take place, he would have to sacrifice something precious. If we look in the Old Testament, anytime there was sin involved, you had to give something up. 
you had to either give up a lamb or a sheep or a dove or grain or something of yours to remedy the sin. And the most precious thing that God could give was his own life. So for hundreds of years, people waited for this Messiah. People waited for the anointed one. It didn't matter how dark it got. It didn't matter how bleak it went. People always looked at scripture and said, there was a promise that God made. There's a plan that he initiated that someone would come and rescue us and someone would come and restore us and have we would have once again relationship with God. Now we come to the person. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 through 7, it says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And verse 7 continues to say, Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, from that time forward, even forever. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. See, this plan was too grand and this promise was too big for just one person to fulfill. So God said, I'm going to send myself. I'm going to send my son, Jesus. So God had to send himself to fulfill the plan and the promise that he had set out. So Christmas is not just a holiday or time off from school. And Jesus is not just a concept, but he is a person that wants to have a friendship with you. Jesus is not just a brand, but he is our savior. He is not just an idea, but he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Christmas is about celebrating the Messiah, the Christ and the son that God has came to lift us up. So that is what the meaning of Christmas is. So when Peter was asked this question earlier in the passage, we heard, you know, Peter was asked this question, who do you say that I am? He saw that Jesus was more than just what people around him saw. People around Peter's in, in Peter's time saw Jesus as maybe free food or free health care or a free miracle or maybe someone who just talked about love. But Peter specifically answered and said, Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. I want to ask you this question. Who do you see Jesus as? Are you seeing Jesus as just an idea? Are you seeing Jesus as someone we just talk about on Sunday morning? Are you seeing Jesus as someone that is um, uh, a good person in history? Or are you seeing Jesus as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Someone who is the promised one, the, the, the fulfillment of the plan and the fulfillment of the promise. There's nothing that gets me more excited than talking about the gospel. See, in all of scripture, there are so many topics and so many things to talk about in the Bible. But there's, there's one thing that gets me excited and one thing that gets me passionate about is talking about the promise and the plan of God that he has, not just in the Bible, but for you, my brother and sister. And so I want to encourage you, uh, just like how he's saying this morning, Better is one day in your courts. We have the ability to enter into God's courts because of Jesus coming down. The plan, the promise, the person can be summed up. And this, even this Christmas season can be summed up in just one simple verse. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So of all the things to talk about in the Bible, this is the crux of the gospel message, Jesus coming down to earth. So this Christmas season, as we are in just this craziness, as we are just in this, this chaos, I want to encourage you to remember the reason for this season that is Jesus. And to understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's plan. He is the fulfillment of God's promise and that God's plan and promise has been fulfilled through the person of Jesus. Amen. So I also want to encourage you to take time to, as you're preparing the elements, I want to share with you just a quick story of what happened last Friday uh, on just the importance of who Jesus is. 
Last Friday, we had a uh, young man share with our students on his testimony of him coming to Christ. Long story short, um, I was able to meet this young man and um, share the gospel with him. And it's one th- I was telling Pastor Daniel, um, you know, it's one thing to share the gospel with someone who is a Hindu or Muslim um, who've never, you know, who has never heard the good news of Jesus. But what do you do when you share the gospel with someone who says, I used to be a Christian, or I used to go to church, but it just wasn't my thing, or I used to believe in Jesus, and I don't believe in him anymore. That was this individual. That was this young man. It was very challenging, and I felt an impression in my heart that I should just share the gospel with him. I did. He kind of brushed it off the first time, but the second time I said, this young man's name is Moises. I said, Moises, Jesus loves you. He cares for you. He wants to restore that relationship with you. He broke down in tears. And it was right there in that moment where he rededicated his life to the Lord. And he shared his testimony with our students. And something he said that was so powerful is, you know, God can save, God can send a son, but you have to reach out. God gave us eyes to read his word. God gave us hands for us to get involved in his kingdom. God gave us a mouth to open up and pray. Though God sent his son, though he initiated the plan and the promise and sent his son, Jesus, as the person to stand in that gap, we have a the ability and the obligation to get involved in what God has said. So I want to encourage you this Christmas season to communicate this reason for this season uh, with your family, with your loved ones, with people that you celebrate this season with. As we are just in, again, like I mentioned earlier, a chaotic time where we're waiting on a, on a cure, we're waiting on a, um, a vaccine for this virus, many people were waiting for a solution to sin. Many people were waiting for a solution to death and sickness, and Jesus came. And so just like how people were waiting for a vaccine, people were waiting for a Christ, and Jesus came. So this morning... I want to encourage you as we partake of the Lord's table to to just wait on God, to wait on his presence and to be thankful for what Jesus did this season. So as we prepare the elements, I want you to just come together as a family and let us uh, partake of the Lord's table. The word of God says, the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took the bread and we had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. So as you're distributing the elements, I'm going to be distributing the elements here with Vic and Pastor Daniel. So Vic, Pastor Daniel, the body of Christ broken for you. Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, He also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity that we have the ability to acknowledge that you are the reason for this season, Lord that you had initiated a plan, a promise, and that was fulfilled and brought forth as a person named Jesus. Lord, I pray that during this season, we can remember the greatest gift that we can give one another is the love of Christ and the good news of the gospel. As we partake of your table, I pray, Lord, that we can examine ourselves, we can examine our heart, and see, Lord, if there's anything in our heart that would bring separation between you and us, Lord, 
I pray that we can confess our sins and say it is by the blood and sacrifice of Jesus that we have been able to once again re-enter into the presence of God. Lord, we ask all these things in your name we pray. Amen. Church, like we sang earlier, like Mel was singing, um, it is, you know, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. It is because the sacrifice of Jesus that we are able to enter into the courts of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So I want to encourage you to spend time in prayer. Spend time just thanking God for the ability to once again re-enter into that fellowship that Adam and Eve had in the garden. And remember that God still promises that He is still going to come again. I don't know what, you know... <laughs> I don't know when Jesus is going to come, but all I know is that we are a day closer to him coming. Amen. And so church, as we are just um, celebrating this season, I want to encourage you to really give the gift that keeps on giving, which is the good news of the gospel. Again, like I mentioned earlier, we had this young man share with our students what happened when he gave his life to Christ. And I can tell you for a fact that his life has been transformed I don't know what or where he would have been if he had not heard the gospel. He was um, just in a horrible place in life. And it was because of the good news of Jesus, the transformation power of Christ, that his life was transformed and he is now living the best life he can live in Jesus. God has placed so many people in your life to where you can share the gospel and the good news. So this Christmas season, I want to encourage you, share the good news, share the gospel, and let's remind ourselves and remind others the reason for this season. Amen. So thank you so much for taking the time to just join us for this Sunday morning. Um, as we wrap up, um, please uh, just uh, check up on one another as we're re-entering uh, quarantine. Please see if anyone needs anything. If anyone needs a run to the grocery store or, or they just need to have a conversation, please check up on one another. And uh, I hope you're doing well. And I'll catch you guys later. Take care and have a great day. Bye-bye.